Hi, this is John Tui. Uh, welcome to today's show. We've got Christine Holtz up here uh, from the Bradford area. Um, era, is that what it's called? The Bradford Era? Era, yes. Okay, in Bradford, Penn. She's a writer and a reporter for the Bradford Era and Bradford Penn. Uh, she also runs a true crime blog, uh, truecrimeandjustice.com. And you can get that later at the end of this video. I'm going to post uh, Christine's, all of her information for you to read. And to my right, yeah, to my left, I'm sorry. We've got uh, Scott Stroka. How was that? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, also, you can get Scott's information. He is the grandson of one of the untouchables, Joe Leeson. And he served as counsel for the U.S. Senate up on the hill, uh, up on Capitol Hill, a federal prosecutor in D.C. And now he works for the uh, Inspector General's Office at the National Science Foundation as an investigative attorney. And Scott has written extensively, you can see it on the internet, on Elliot Ness and the Untouchables. And he's currently working on a book about his grandfather and his role in the Capone case. And last but not least, we have Rebecca McFarlane. Uh, she is a recognized international expert in the life and times of Elliot Ness post Chicago. After, and that's what, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, research, she's been just about everywhere, haven't you? I've seen you, uh, you're in magazines, books, People Magazine, History Channel, a and &E, and so forth, it goes on. You also coordinated uh, Ness's, uh, Elliot Ness's uh, reburial, is that how we should say it, in Cleveland? No, it wasn't a reburial. Um, he had had a memorial service after he died, but his ashes had been kept in a garage for 40 years. Wow. And I was lucky to receive them, and we conducted a free funeral. Yeah, well, we'll go into that in just a minute. Uh, she is also a fourth uh, generation uh, Clevelander, which impresses me. Uh, well, about the, well, you know, I'm a second generation American, so anybody who goes back through. Uh, Elliot Ness, uh, we're going to cover his uh, time as Cleveland safety director uh, from 1935-41, right? Correct, 42. Well, kind of, we, we can touch on the, we're having another program with Scott later. Uh, where we can discuss the untouchables and so forth and prohibition and all that. But I thought today, no one knows. What, we, what I hope we could accomplish today is to take the myth out of the legend, and even downgrade the legend a bit, to a man who, by my reading, pretty much an everyday guy um, who enjoyed a beer but, and was married three times to, were they all actresses? Actresses? No. Artists, rather. Were they all artists? artists. Two were artists. Oh. Yeah. My wife tells me it's difficult. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to touch first, Rebecca, was why don't we work to clear up this mean myth that uh, Ness was a drunkard and he died of alcoholism at 52? 54. 54. What's the story? Well, um, I think it's significant perhaps to know that he was raised Christian scientist. Mm -hmm. And that was very important to his mother that he should follow the um, Excuse me. beliefs of the church. Mm -hmm. And so he was not known to go to a doctor. Um, when he was in Cowdersport, I understand he did go to a doctor there. Port is what? Cowdersport, Pennsylvania. That was where he lived the last eight months of his life. Oh. And um, he had gone there for a business opportunity. And unfortunately, that is where he passed away. But I've researched him for about 35 years, give or take. And I was fortunate at the beginning of my years of studying about his life to have met people who knew him firsthand. Um, Al Sutton, who was safety director of Cleveland after he um, Victor Schreckengost, who was a world-renowned artist and a friend of both his second and third wives. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, all these men that I met, they all said that he was a person of honorable character, followed through on what he said he did. Did he like to have a cocktail? Yes. But post-war, a lot of people did. You know, even my own grandmother liked a Manhattan on occasion. Is this so European immigrants, right? Central European immigrants. Norway, Norwegian immigrants. Here was part of the, part of the uh, culture. Very likely, yeah. 
So, but um, I have yet to find anyone who said they ever knew him to be drunk. So I disagree with that. You don't want to talk about specifics. I don't blame you. Uh, but generally, what? how did that come to, to grow, that story? Um, the rumor probably grew because of an attitude in the newspapers at that time. And maybe Chris could talk about that. You know, a lot of times back then, the newspapers were really all we had for media. We didn't have TV like we do now or the internet, for goodness sakes. But the newspapers really ran the town. And if a newspaper editor decided that he wanted to start a story, he could, and it was believed. And um, there was a, a big backstory behind all that, but I think that was what spread the rumor. But I studied and studied it, and for all I knew, um, it's not true. What, what isn't true? That that he was an alcoholic, that that rumor that he was an alcoholic was true. Scott can touch on this a little, Scott? Sure, yeah, and I think where a lot of this comes from, you do have to go back to prohibition because prohibition, after all, uh, made alcohol illegal. And so you had um, the, the forces that led to prohibition's enactment were kind of moral crusaders um, for temperance, the teetotalers. Yeah. And I think people sometimes confuse what drove Elliot Ness and the Untouchables with what drove uh, the temperance movement. Um, Elliot Ness and my grandfather and the other agents got involved be basically because um, prohibition created a vacuum that in turn created organized crime and turned Chicago into uh, really just a, a violent asphalt jungle. And, um, you know, so the untouchables weren't so much against alcohol as a moral issue. They were against um, people who violated the law and people who used violence to violate the law. And so um, when prohibition ended, uh, Elliot Ness and his agents were free to enjoy uh, alcoholic beverages just like every other American. And when Ness and my grandfather joined the alcohol tax unit after the untouchables disbanded and prohibition ended. Um, they were doing the same kind of work, but they were working against uh, bootleggers who didn't pay taxes um, on their alcohol, not, uh, not because um, alcohol was immoral uh, uh, or because they had something against alcohol per se. John Vittorio, um, who was a boss before Capone, he went down that way in the late 30s, early for late, well after Prohibition had ended. Uh, Christine, what's your experience? My thinking is uh, because he's that TV show and later movies just blew this poor man up into uh, a boring, you know, let me, I told Rebecca this, let me, if you don't know, I probably readers don't know. Um, what is his name? Uh, Robert Stack, the actor who portrayed him. I'm old enough to remember the show. We would sit down in front of the TV. Uh, and it was in black and white. And that horrible uh, newsman would come on. What, do you remember his name? Today, Al Capone jumped on a boat. Remember him? Uh, he was a big shot in the 20s and 30s. And so he would give that rapid fire machine gun. Mitchell? Mitchell. Yeah, Mitchell. Um, Mitchell. Mitchell. Oh. Walter? Yeah, Walter Winchell, who I've heard just horrible things about that guy um, as a reporter. I mean, he was not above anything. So and he would come on, and then you'd have Robert Stack, you know, and he's clean cut and stuff. But Robert Stack came from an old American family, one of the first families of California, very wealthy, uh, roommate for John Kennedy when they were young men. So the portrayal he gave of Ness as his straight arrow, I mean, would you want to sit next to Robert Stack on an airplane? And the reality, I think people found it funny that a guy like Ness would die of alcohol. Not odd, but just funny that he died of alcohol. I think that spurred on to some point. I wonder, I wonder if there was also something that we said for uh, Hoover at the time was, he, he was pretty well established as far as manipulating 
uh, media. And I do know that I think it's it's fairly well understood what happened with Melvin Purvis as far as as far as tarnishing his his uh, reputation, what, deservedly or not. But but I do believe that it, we can agree that it happened. I think that. Hoover did not appreciate any sort of uh, uh, spotlight being shown anywhere else. And I could see where uh, different reports or different sort of uh, things would be said that could uh, take away from somebody's credibility, such as a respected civil servant. I wonder if that played any role in it, Hoover's sort of uh, petty jealousies against anybody who was taking the uh, light off of his, uh, his voice, so to speak. Maybe because he did the same thing to Purvis, as you know. He dropped that. What do you think, Christine? Um, I mean, from what I've researched, it's kind of like there's, it seems like two sides of the spectrum. Either he was um, like this straight upstanding man, or I've seen the other side where, yes, he ended up dying a broke alcoholic. And I mean, I think it's interesting, Rebecca, that you actually have spoken with people that he knew, because I mean, you figure you can trust more from somebody who actually knew him. Um, and like you were saying with the newspapers, I've researched back in our old newspapers and the things that they have in those papers are, it's pretty much like you said, the editor, whatever they say goes. Some of the things are just ridiculous in the newspapers from that time. So I could see how things could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially the, well, one paper, the Tribune, which is a heavyweight, was a heavyweight in the Midwest. I mean, those guys, they'll they write virtually anything to sell a newspaper, right. you know? To, to address his death, I will say that I was able to read the doctor's report, and he did die from a heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, did alcohol have anything to do with it? I can't see why it did. Yeah. I mean, he was under a lot of stress for certain, but um, it was a heart attack that took him. However, um, I will say also, I got to talk to Robert Stack. Um, I had invited him to the funeral. Oh. I thought it might be nice to have him here in Cleveland when we would bury Elliot Ness. And um, he had to turn me down because his health wasn't very good. In oh. fact, as it turned out, he died only a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. But in my conversations with him, and he sent me a couple of Christmas cards afterwards, he said that he was so honored to have portrayed Elliot Ness because he was a man of integrity and that um, Robert Stack totally credited the memory of Elliot Ness for having given him his career in Hollywood. And without the opportunity to portray him, he never would have been able to be the success that he was. So mm. uh, Stack struck me as a very humble man. Yeah, I'm sure he was, yeah. Yeah. He told me, and it's a good point, that his years in the Prohibition uh, Bureau were minuscule compared to his career. Yeah, two years, that was nothing in the life of a man who, you know, I mean, you're 54 years old and you look back two years when you were a very young man, it just really wasn't that significant of a job. In fact, he had to be talked into writing his alleged autobiography, The Untouchables, because he just didn't think it was all that significant and that anyone would care. Why, why do you say, I didn't read it, it was the other fellow wrote it mostly? Oscar Fraley. Oscar Fraley. Did he write it mostly freely, Christine? Um, yes, he actually, he penned most of it, but I believe it was kind of like the, the beginning was more written by Ness, like the introduction. Um, and yeah, they wrote it in Cowdersport and actually he passed away, I believe a bit, it was a month before the book actually came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never knew how infamous he would become. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he never saw the show then. No. Yeah, sort of sad. Did you yeah. your grandfather mentioned in the uh, book, Scott? Yeah, he's um, so he's he's mentioned uh, throughout the book. Um, Ness, uh, he, you know, he was he was tasked by uh, the U.S. Attorney in Chicago, George E. Q. Johnson, uh, mm -hmm. with putting together a, a team of agents to work on the Capone investigation. Um, my grandfather grew up in Indiana on a farm. He was in the Navy in World War I, and um, he, he learned how to use uh, an acetylene blowtorch repairing giant locomotives on the, the B&O Railroad in uh, going through Indiana. 
and he, um, he and his brother-in-law, uh, Donald Cookin, who's also mentioned in the Fraley book, uh, they, they left Indiana and went to Michigan and took the exam to become prohibition agents. And Cookin was sent to uh, Chicago to work with Elliot Ness's brother-in-law. Um, and then uh, my grandfather was sent to Detroit. And I'll see if I can put this picture up to the camera. This is a family photograph. My grandfather is uh, the guy in the overalls, uh, third from uh, the camera's right. Mm -hmm. And um, that picture was taken in 1929, just before a raid. And uh, they were battling the Purple Gang at that time. And I think it's because um, my grandfather's brother-in-law went to work for Alexander Jamie, who was Elliot Ness's brother-in-law. That's how I suspect that Ness learned about my grandfather. And there's a scene... Uh, there's a pilot episode of the Robert Stack series that's a, a two-hour movie that aired as a pilot to the TV series that pretty much tracks the book and is more accurate than not, uh, and a lot more accurate than, of course, the rest of the series ended up being. But there's a scene in that pilot movie where Elliot Ness is literally rifling through file cabinets looking for uh, personnel files of agents that he can bring down. And through the research that I did at the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, um, I got a hold of my grandfather's and all of the other Untouchables personnel files. And in there, um, you can actually, I actually have copies of uh, the telegrams that were sent from Chicago to Detroit summoning uh, my grandfather, and then some summoning the other agents to Chicago uh, to work on the Capone investigation, where he used his blowtorch to uh, destroy um, whiskey stills and beer barrels. Mm. You know, uh, Desi Lu put out another movie uh, with Robert Stack. By the way, what I meant was, I meant the Robert Stack character, not the actor, but the character that he portrayed in that called The Guns of Zangara. Have you seen that? And I researched that and I put it in my first book and I did a lot of work. It's a completely unknown. Whoever was advising to that film, because I watched it later, it's pretty accurate. Um, and uh, an incident, the killing of Mary Anton Cermak in Chicago by the mob. Um, they had it right in 1958 or whatever it was. Christine, let me start because I'm going to ask Rebecca how the end of his life. What's who? Who, who was he? Uh, Ness. What's his background? His early background. You're. Are you asking me or Rebecca? No, I say I'll end with Rebecca since she oh. was close towards the end of his life. Um, his early background. He was born in 1903. He was the eldest of four children. He was born to Peter Ness and Emma King. Um, he had gone to the University of Chicago where he got his degree in political science and business administration. Um, and actually, he worked for a retail credit company for a while, and then he went back to school to take a course in criminology, which was taught by August Vollmer. And actually, August Vollmer and his brother-in-law, who worked for the Bureau of Investigation, are said to be some of his biggest inspirations for entering law enforcement. Um, and then uh, after... Hoover was uh, elected shortly after he started, he was trying to implement small teams of agents to um, infiltrate these bootlegging gangs. And um, they, it kind of went to the wayside for a little bit. After the St. Valentine's Day massacre, I believe, in February 14th of 1929, um, that's when Bugs Moran, seven members of his gang, were gunned down by Capone and one of his hitmen. Um, after that is when they really decided to start implementing these um, small groups of agents. And at age 27, Ness was recruited to um, work with, I mean, what inevitably became the Untouchables. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why they were called the Untouchables is because at that point in time, usually the mobs bribed political officials yeah. to kind of turn the other way so they could do whatever they wanted to do. Um, and 
pretty much he and his team were unbribable. They were incorruptible. Um, Roger Tui, who was a, you know, a fairly good sized bootlegger in the suburbs, wouldn't you think, Tim? I, mean, was, yeah, I, I think so. He was really a better quality. To show you how corruptible they were, Anton Cermak was the Cook County president, I think they called him, and later mayor, as well as president, combined the two powers. He's a powerful guy. Uh, he <laughs> too put out a, a beer with Anton Cermak's face on, on the label, under Anton Cermak's name, so he could hand it out at political forums. And he, Tui was left completely alone. So, I mean, it, it's pretty corrupt when you can- Delivered the beer for the, uh, the, some kind of party for the Cook County presidency. He, yeah, I mean- he it For their, uh, <laughs> their summer picnic. Yeah. <laughs> they also said that at, uh, I've forgotten his name, uh, the, the, um, he was, oh, Coughlin, Coughlin and, uh, who were they, what was their names? Uh, the early bosses, that on every Friday, there was a line. Yeah, oh, uh, now I'm going to draw a blank. Coughlin, and there was a line going around his cigar store of cops in uniform collecting their envelopes. Yeah, the aldermen, yeah. So, I'm sorry, I just thought we'd add that to tell people how really corrupt that city was. Yeah. Um, World War One was he? No, he was too young. He would have been too young, 1903. Yeah, yeah. 14. I'm sorry. And he's so he's done all this mob busting, and then what? Then he went to Cleveland, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. What happened? What do you think, Rebecca? Actually, um, he went to uh, to Cincinnati for a short while. Yes, that's, yes, when, for the Treasury Department's alcohol tax unit. Alcohol tax unit, mm -hmm. yes. So in Cleveland, he is the public safety director, which is like the chief of police? No, well, in some cities, yes, the position is comparable or, you know, parallel. But no, for him, he came to Cleveland to run Cleveland's alcohol tax unit. Oh. And he was in charge of 30 men. In fact, it was said that he found and closed our country's largest still. It was a four-story still. <laughs> and um, that caught the eye of our reform mayor at that time, Harold Burton. Right. And Harold Burton asked him a year after he had been here if he would serve as safety director. Yeah. And that was a very bold move on Nessa's part to accept that because we were the most dangerous city in the country. There was no other major city that had more murder, rape, robbery, juvenile crime, and automobile accidents huh. than Cleveland had the most. <laughs> I, think I think that's an interesting topic, uh, reform mayors. I, I, I didn't realize that they had one in, in, in Cleveland. I know Chicago had Devers and eventually there was LaGuardia in New York, but that, that speaks to the corruption and the type of men that were acquired, I'm sorry, the type of people who were acquired at these times and I guess they were, the only they were able to take positions, but uh, it's such rampant corruption that we actually had reform parties and to come in and try and straighten things out for whatever short amount of time they could get on the ballot. So and those men roughly served at the same time, more or less. Same <laughs> right after prohibition, a lot of people wanted to straighten things out and didn't get. Oh, so some years ago, it became well known that there was a mass murder or a serial killer, rather stalking the homeless in Cleveland. I may not have this right. The homeless in Cleveland along a uh, 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 skid row that they had. Mm -hmm. Kingsbury Run was the name of the little town, I believe. Okay. It was a corner of the railway called Kingsbury Run. It's still there today. It's where the trains would slow down to come into the city. And so people would live in cardboard shanties mm -hmm. um, able to hop on the rails, so to speak, to find a job anywhere. I have, I have been there since we have a rail yard through there. Were you there? Yeah. Can't get caught, though. No, no, <laughs> you know, not, I not, there. Not, not by choice. I work for the railroad. So it was, oh, then it was you know. passing through, uh, you know, railroad town. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, over 300 people lived down there. And uh, as my grandmother would say, there were a lot of good men did bad things and were driven to do things they would not have done. 
what they needed to feed their families. So they live in a cardboard shack and they might have a family up in one of the suburbs of Cleveland, but they'd live down there so they could hop on the trains. And that is where this um, mad butcher of Kingsbury Run, as they called him, would do his uh, hunting. Really? He cut them up, Christine? Um, he dismembered them. And there's 12 known victims, but Lord knows how many there actually were. Yeah. Um, well, the indigent population just didn't keep up. Wow. Wow. They never actually caught him. Uh, and like somewhat of a controversial move, uh, Ness decided to burn down what they called the hobo jungle. Some people yeah. referred to it as to these cardboard shanties. And mysteriously, the murder stopped afterwards. I wonder. But it's curious. I wonder what provoked uh, him to stop. Well, he was put in an insane asylum, that's why. It's, there's no doubt in my mind who committed the murders, as well as there was no doubt in Elliot Ness's mind. But Ness didn't quite have enough to bring it to trial yet. But I think it was really a brilliant move to set fire to the hobo jungle because... The praying ground. Yeah. He did a favor to the people. He moved them all out, put them all in shelters. Nobody was just tossed on the street. They were given good housing. And then he burned down the cardboard shacks because it took away the opportunity to go yeah. down there and prey on those people. Yeah, it took the killing fields away. So they had a suspect and he, oh, I didn't know that. And he was- Yes, they did. Oh. Yeah, he did. Ness did, yeah. The similar thing with the um, Jack the Ripper. The guy they were sure did it, uh, a Polish immigrant. They put him in, uh, in a mental asylum and, uh, and it stopped. Yeah. So it's one way around the law a little bit. And was he successful as Ness as the, uh, well, let, let me not go. Then he ran for mayor? After he was safety director. He had worked for a while with the Debo company in Canton. And then he ran for mayor because he was just talked into it. He was very apolitical. He was even quoted as saying he didn't care if you were Republican or Democrat, so long as you were honest. Mm -hmm. And uh, for him to have run on the Republican ticket, it was just as a favor to, a, to his friends. And he didn't think he could really stand against the incumbent mayor, who was a very popular Democrat. And he didn't win, but I don't think he was sorry about it because his heart wasn't in the race anyway. And he married three times, Christine. Uh, they were artists. Artists. Well, uh, Rebecca said two of them were. The, I know the woman in particular that he was still, Elizabeth, was it, in Cowdersport? Um, yes. Yes. Uh, when he moved to Cowdersport, he moved with Elizabeth and their son. And I know she was an artist because she really integrated into the community with the different uh, like it, with the art community in Calvary's mm. Yeah, yeah. So he's run for mayor. He was obviously, well, no. He was a successful uh, public safety director. Was that fair? Yeah. Oh, I would say so, yes. He turned the city around. We won the National Safety Award after he was here only three years. Yeah, yeah. And that says a lot. And then he runs for mayor. That didn't work out. Um, what becomes of him then? Well, like I say, he went to the Debo Company, which is a safe and lock company. And today you can see a lot of ATM machines have the name across the top of it. And uh, he was their director for a while. And then the opportunity to go to Cowdersport for the Guaranteed Paper Company, where they came up with the concept of watermarking paper to prevent forgery, that tempted him. So he picked up his wife and their young adopted son and moved to Cowdersport. The, the son died, right, Christine? Yes, I believe he passed away. I don't know. Do yes. you know Rebecca, what? Multiple sclerosis? No, he had leukemia. Yeah. 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 Uh, by the way, we're not avoiding Scott. We've got him here as our, as our backup because we're, what we wanted to do, I think I said this earlier, we're trying to get a, a feel on who this guy is so that when we do have Scott in that panel, you know he wasn't just some uh, gun crazy person would know with ice in his blood. And that's what we want to establish here today. The human being, um, Elliot. I think it's like going back to when he was working for a, for a, a 
security firm it was his, doing credit investigations. I mean, that, that sort of stuck along the same path, security and, and investigation and, and, and safety in general, security as, as a concept, whether it's uh, or in the private sector or municipal or, or, or federal, it sounds like that was his course and, and based on it working in the a credit firm, that was what sort of steered him and then he, he propelled, he, he, he followed it to the higher and higher levels and, and really had some quite success at it. Chris, right. did you read that story? I'm sorry, did I interrupt you, Rebecca? No, I was just agreeing with him. Um, <laughs> hey, have you read this story that's out there? Um, that one of the, I apparently was the, his last wife's family, uh, descendants, found a stock certificate. Have you been following that? From Diebold and it's a really yeah, weird. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know whatever came about that if they, but I did, I was reading on, um, they actually have like the certificates at the Elliott Ness Museum, which is in Cowdersport. Oh. Um, it's actually in the building below um, where Ness's office was. Um, and uh, Re Rebecca and I have participated for two years in the Elliott Ness Festival in Cowdersport. And uh, last year, I, I performed the role of uh, U.S. Attorney George Johnson in yeah. a reenactment of the trial of Al Capone. Oh, really? Oh, I have yeah, photos I on. up on the website, the <laughs> best website. What, when is the? When is it? Is there a time when it's held? It's it. Well, it's been the third weekend in in July for the first two years, and we'll see what they're they're planning it. Obviously, because of COVID, it had to be canceled this year, but we're planning to uh, to get it back up and running in 2021. What, what do you do? What, what's involved with Well, I get for, for my part, we, we did the reenactment of the Capone trial. So I the whole day, what, what's the whole day over? What do you, how do you, what do you do? What's the events? There are, there are a series of, um, of events and, um, of different, uh, I mean, anything. If you're if you're interested in in the history of the Untouchables and in Elliot Ness, there are events that are centered around that. There are things uh, for kids. You can have a pasta with Al Capone at a local Italian restaurant. Uh, you can go and visit the very various places where Ness uh, lived when he was in Countersport. The the movie theater. They have a really beautiful old uh, single screen movie theater in Countersport, and they. They've shown um, The Untouchables and uh, the movie Road to Perdition uh, they showed last year on the big screen. Um, I have gotten, I have gathered the descendants of a number of The Untouchables and we had a kind of reunion of, uh, of the agent's descendants uh, the last two years. So, and Rebecca, you can, you can f add, add more to that. There's really a lot to do over the three days. It sounds like fun. But... Yeah, it's a tiny town and they put their whole heart and soul into it. There's, uh, I think, probably very significant is all the historical automobiles they parked down Main Street. Mm. A lot from the 20s and 30s. It's, it's um, very what? clever. Pennsylvania? Christine? What was that? Is that Western Pennsylvania? Cowdersport? Um, Northwestern Pennsylvania. Oh, way, way up then, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really neat, the festival. It's like they transform you. You go back in time. You step out of a time machine. There's people dressed in the time period. They encourage people who come and attend to dress in that time period, like the 1920s, 1930s. There's flappers walking up and down the streets. Um, like Rebecca was mentioning, there's cars of all the, they call them the eras of Ness, like his time in Cleveland, his time in Chicago, his time in Countersport, all those eras of cars are lining the streets. It's just, and they, the whole town gets in on it too. The businesses will have specials, the restaurants will be serving, you know, themed food for that time. And it's just, it seems like a really, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. But I, I plan on it next year as long as they have it. So, Cam, yes, want to go? We'll dress as flappers. What do you say? I, I yeah, I, I've uh, I could dig something up. I don't. I might have to. Might have to shave. I don't know, but I think I could. An extra flapper dress here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> a zoot suit. Pull out, yeah. 
So I'll have my uh, uh, V8, uh, V8 Ford and we'll, uh, we'll roll on out there. Fantastic. Yeah. My former business partner actually has a collection. We could take anyone we want. <laughs> there you go. All work, you know? Uh, so he's divorced three times. I think it's really significant to know that Ness was actually the youngest of his family. Yeah. And the first four children were born rather close together. And then I think it was 13 years went by before Ness was born. So he's kind of doted on as a child. He was very studious, very serious, really mature beyond his years. And that's really the type of personality you see, I think, in his adult years. And because of that, he was very academic and business-like. He was proud of his business degree. To have gone to college in his day was significant yeah. with the Great Depression and all that. So he was very proud of his college degree. Um, and um, everything he did, it seemed he was very methodical in what he did. He wasn't like the Robert Stack portrayal of him that was shoot him up and all that. But um, he had a good head for business, and that's kind of how he ran the city of Cleveland, um, from my perspective, because that's my specialty, not really Chicago or his eight months in Countersport were unfortunately so short. Um, he didn't well, make even money. with a, a good business head, he, yeah. his, he left his wife several thousand, which is a lot more today, 9,000 in debt, which would be in debt. Yeah. What, a hundred? Yeah thousand right How but he was close with his family and he he wanted more than anything if i heard something from all of his friends they all said he just desperately wanted a family he wanted to come home to the you know pot roast and potatoes and have children and all that with his first wife it was said she was a bit of a blue blood from chicago and when they settled here in cleveland they settled unfortunately in Bay Village, which is a wonderful city, but it was way outside of Cleveland. So he had quite a commute, about an hour into the city every day. And she was left alone with nothing to do. They didn't have children. I think they just really grew apart. He was almost never home in those first four years. And so they were quietly divorced. She went back to Chicago, moved in with her family again. Um, then he did what most people would do in the 30s. He went downtown on a Saturday night and had a blue plate dinner, and he loved to dance. His sisters, his older sisters, used to practice on him yeah. as a child, and he was an accomplished ballroom dancer. And so they would go to the Hotel Cleveland and other ballrooms. We had Bing Crosby, um, Frank Sinatra, um, Bobby Dorsey band, you name it. We had big names performing in Cleveland. He loved to dance, and that's where he met his second wife, Eveline. Um, she was a sketch artist and drew all of the ladies' dress illustrations for our local newspapers. Right. And um, I think, truthfully, with their marriage, again, they both thought it'd be great to have children, but I don't know if her heart was in it because she loved the fact that her career just skyrocketed. Yeah, yeah. She became a children's author, was very popular, won the Caldecott Award Medal, yeah. and um, under the name Ness after they were married. That's a prestigious award. I didn't know, really. I didn't she know. did, yeah. And from Victor Schreckengost, who was a good friend of Elliot Ness and Eveline, he told me, Victor told me, he really thinks that Eveline just outgrew him. She mm -hmm. wanted to be in New York where her publisher was. She loved the limelight. She loved the glamour of New York City. But because she cared for him so much, almost more like a friend than a husband, mm -hmm. she found him the girl of his dreams. <laughs> what second wife finds the third wife? for her husband, but I've had it corroborated several times, and without a doubt, I am certain that Eveline said to her friend Elizabeth, you've got to meet Elliot, because when they met, it was like, you know, the stars came out, yeah. and they fell madly in love, got married very soon after the ink was hardly dry on the divorce papers, 
and he married Elizabeth and they couldn't have been happier. They were a really good match. So he can thank his second wife for that great match of the third wife. Unusual? Nothing? How long was, he with his, was he with his third wife? How long were they, did his final marriage uh, from the time he married until the time he passed? About 10 years with Elizabeth until he died. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Christine was adopted, right? That wasn't his natural. The son Robert was three years old when they adopted him from an orphanage. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. That was the second wife or the? With a third wife. Third wife. Yeah. They adopted, yeah. Second wife, she was really just too busy for him, you know, publishing and drawing and having a good time. <laughs> so, again, how did he get into financial trouble? Because his career seems fairly steady. We all changed jobs. For more pay and uh, wh wh how did he end up broke? From what I understand and maybe Christine can explain this better from the Countersport perspective, I understand that he invested heavily in the Guarantee Paper and Fidelity Company because he truly believed with his whole heart that watermarking paper was a thing of the future. Mm. And he was right, because now there's no paper or dollar bill or anything that isn't watermarked. But he didn't realize how corrupt the company was and the infighting and all that that was going on. And then when the company, he died before the company actually went under and turned around, but he had invested everything he had, I understand. And that's why. Were you able to find out? Christine? What was that? What were you able to find out? Oh, um, well, he. Your local. Uh, um, he was basically the water marking formula. They said it was patented. They found out that it wasn't actually, they didn't actually have like it patented. Um, and the CEO of the company, it was George. Um, Champanor, I don't know how to pronounce it, but he, um, he was not a very, he wasn't very involved in the business. He kind of let it go to the wayside while Ness and his colleagues tried to um, keep it afloat. Um, and basically, George made an exit strategy and his exit strategy was screw the investors, I'm going to Texas and you should come with me. Yeah, yeah. Ness being the upstanding man he was, refused to do that and he tried to make it work the best he could yeah. uh, unfortunately it it didn't quite work out but um today um it was eventually turned into tc specialties which is a um commercial printing business which is still in existence today at, at, at what point does he meet up with uh his, his uh ghostwriter uh when he's in pennsylvania yeah, it's shortly before his death. It was Oscar Fraley. Um, and like Rebecca was saying, he wasn't necessarily gung-ho about writing the book, but he was um, encouraged by Fraley. They worked together and um, Fraley wrote the majority of the book, but um, Ness did have a big hand in it. He wrote like the kind of the beginning of it, the introduction. And, yeah, they all, um, they all kept scrapbooks. My grandfather had a scrapbook. Ness had a scrapbook, which you can see at the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland. And they, you know, they, they very meticulously cut out uh, newspaper articles about uh, significant uh, raids that they were involved in and um, other, other newsletters and newspapers that, that mentioned them and that they were involved in. And they were great historical resource because it kind of tells you what moments in that whole story they were really interested in because they actually took the time to clip them out and, and put together these giant um, scrapbooks. And one of the fascinating things I found um, when I went to Cleveland to look at Elliot Ness's scrapbook was that it's filled with letters from ordinary Americans from all over the country who after the Capone case was completed, wrote to him and thanked him for um, standing up for law and order in Chicago at a time when law and order seemed to have collapsed. Um, uh, Rebecca, um, so he's, uh, by the way, the average age for a man to die of a heart attack is in his mid fifties, which he died. 
I think now we have a better understanding. He's obviously under great, mm -hmm. he's facing failure, if you think about it, for the first time. He has, right. He's had a pretty brilliant career. Without a doubt. Yeah. I think it might have been a high point for him to reconnect with his friend Oscar Fraley, whom he knew from his days in Cleveland. And when Oscar wrote to him, and by the way, all of the letters are at the Western Reserve Historical Society, and he wrote to him and said, you know, I think it's a good idea. We should write a biography of your time in Chicago. And <clears throat> Elliot's letters back to Oscar are kind of very much like, oh, no, who's going to care? But in the end, he agreed. Um, Elliot's older sisters are the ones who kept his scrapbooks, and they were meticulous. Scott couldn't be more right. <laughs> there were so many of them in really big scrapbooks. But, um, and he loaned them to Oscar Fraley to do some of the, you know, beginnings of the book. That's true. But um, from what I understand, over the months that went by, Ness would write a little bit and send it to Oscar. Oscar would let him know, this is great. I've got another chapter done. And then after, you know, a handful of months, Oscar Fraley wrote to Ness and said, the book is done. Here's a sample copy. And Ness wrote, this is not my story. This isn't what I told you. And Fraley told him, tough. This is a bestseller. And he was right. It was a runaway bestseller. Was it? And I also got to talk to Oscar Fraley. I got to call him at his apartment in New York. And I asked him, I said, you know, when you knew that Ness said this wasn't his story, why did you put his name on the book? Why didn't you just say it was your rendition of a you know, fictional story about Elliot Ness. And he said, you know, it it paid better if it was Ness's story. It was said to be a biography. How much of it do you think is just silly nonsense? It's actually mostly true. Is it? And part of part of what I've done is literally gone through the book and and looked at what what matches up and what doesn't. And um, so N Ness and Fraley met through a mutual friend in New York City. And they were at a bar one night, and Ness was kind of sitting there quietly uh, nursing his drink while Fraley and their friends uh, were chatting it up. And uh, the, the mutual friend said to Fraley, you know, you should, you should hear about what, what this guy did in Chicago. And um, Fraley said he kind of couldn't believe it because Ness was so kind of quiet and, and reserved and sort of, you know, in a way, you know, boyish looking, but he had kind of filled out a little more by this time. So he was a little bit more doughy looking. Um, and so he and Fraley did eventually reconnect. Uh, they spent some, I don't know, Rebecca, was it weeks or, or months in the Crittenden Hotel in Cowdersport? Um, poor, they, they basically got a room at the hotel and, and got the scrapbook and um, all the newspaper clippings and just started pouring through them. And Ness got very frustrated because um, there were certain things that he could remember very clearly and certain things, even the names of his agents that he couldn't remember at all. And so he eventually wrote up a 21 page manuscript that he thought um, captured the best of his recollections. And that's still, that exists um, today still. And so Fraley used that 21 page manuscript as the basis for his uh, final product. Yeah, I think- What year did the book come out again? I'm sorry. What year did the book come out again? 56. Yeah. And I think we're uh, one amok was when the script writers got it at Desi Lu. What I, what I think really took hold of the show is November of 1957 is when America got mob fever. And it is when probably the world got mob fever with uh, with uh, Appalachian and uh, Keith Offer followed. Yeah, after, after yeah, you had you had Keith Offer and McClellan ten years later, and Appalachian and Chiancana and you know I'm I'm not I'm saying it's a different era, but what I'm saying is it really came about at the right time. Huh. And you had a name like Ness, who people know in conjunction with 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 Kona, I think that that was that that show being the perfect storm really yeah. was. Uh, yeah, and prior to that, these these not so secret societies, the mafia and so, be took on that aura of secret societies and so. But there was a lot of the movie about Joe Valachi came out in '60. The whole genre just 
came out of nowhere. So they went from the Edward G. Robinson uh, lone gunman, got bad guy to more mob related films, you know. What else do you have in that museum, by the way, in case anybody wants to drop by? The Case Museum, I'm sorry, the Midwestern, uh, I didn't write oh, it. Oh, Western Reserve Historical Society Museum, yeah. He's watching yeah. it, you should drop by. What oh, it's a wonderful museum, yeah. But I think significant too that they have in their collection the letter that Ness wrote to Capone, Capone <laughs> to Oscar Fraley saying that he did not care for the book as being his story. Yeah. And Oscar offered him if he wanted to sell off the rights that he would give Ness $300 and Ness took it because Ooh. he needed the money, $300, which yeah. means that his widow did not get a penny from the rights of the best-selling book yeah. or when Desilu Productions bought the you know, rights to air it on TV, she never saw a penny. She struggled the rest of her days till she died. She died so poor, I held her ashes. They were in a brown paper lunch bag. Her cousin could only afford to have her cremated and put in a lunch bag. So um, she didn't earn a penny from that story or the TV show. And Robert Stack felt badly about that. I didn't want to head there right now, but the same thing with Ness, right? You found him in a shoebox. He it was in a shoebox. It was the ashes were given to me after I was on the A&E TV show. The person who held his ashes all those years um, had the ashes of all three of them. So I did conduct the funeral for Elliot, Elizabeth, and their adopted son, Robert. But first, let me go back if we can. Can you tell us a little bit more about the museum? Because people, uh, our watchers are people who actually go and see yeah. the thing. So what, where is it? And what? Um, the Western Reserve Historical Society is in University Circle in Cleveland. And it, it has records going back over 150 years of everything and anything that happened in Cleveland including all of Elliot Ness's scrapbooks. Um, the Cleveland Police Museum, which I serve on their board, um, we have a very thorough compendium of everything related to the Kingsbury Run murders. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> and the world expert on the Kingsbury Run murders, Dr. James Bedall serves on our board of trustees as well. And he's written several books on the Kingsbury Run murders. Christine, I have two questions for you. One is uh, the museum uh, in Pennsylvania. Is an Elliot Ness uh, Museum? The Elliot Ness Museum, yes. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. What is it? What, what is it? What? Um, well, it started out, Steve Green, um, he started collecting some antique cars from that era. Um, and I mean, because of his history, that's where he spent his final days. Um, it's kind of their claim to fame. So um, originally it was just a, like a sidewalk viewing museum where you could look in and see the, the different cars. Now it's expanded to, um, there's multiple cars. There's like a bathtub gin exhibit. There's exhibits from um, his different business ventures and counter sports. Um, Mm -hmm. There's like a bootlegging exhibit. It's pretty large. Yeah, let me ask you too. You did a lot of research, I can tell from what you wrote. What's the most surprising thing you came across about Ness? The most surprising thing? I, hmm. Or the most revealing thing about him? For me, it was the fact that he didn't die an alcoholic, which made me happy. That's actually today, like talking to Rebecca, it's, it's, well, and to everybody, it's refreshing because it, it was kind of hard because I, I didn't want to believe that. And it's nice that you actually, that she actually talked to people. Um, because yeah, it, um, pretty much some of the information said that he, yeah, was an alcoholic and he. It's, it's, you can look on the internet and just put down Elliot Ness died alcoholic. It's everywhere. It's a given fact. Mm -hmm. you have to look for some some people, it's a very satisfying sort of uh, you know anti-hero ending for for somebody that's been held up as a hero. It's sort of a you know, some people like to 
point at it and say, ha, the, the great crusader against pro, you know, the great, the great crusader for prohibition died an alcoholic. Not important. Yeah. And he was a cop and cops have enemies. Uh, there was a, a long too. Um, and he, uh, but cops, enemies who were cops, I, I think that, uh, yeah. even at that time. Um, I think it's significant to know he was never a police officer. Well, you know, uh, uh, a law enforcement yeah. uh, director of public safety, yeah, but it was more a business type position, yeah. People in Chicago that he busted lived well into the 60s, some into the 70s, and they would have been really happy to. Uh, well, I told you, uh, no, I'm sorry, I, I talked to uh, Christine about it. Um, suppose I don't believe it was Luciano, but supposedly the story checked out, the story is a true story that Luciano told, I think it was more the commission, told Sinatra, go over and find this uh, Desilu Productions thing and put an end to this, because the mob had a lot of pressure going on. Tony Arcota was under tax trouble. They were- That was Nitty. No, that was after Nitty. That was Paul Rica. Yeah, that, that, that's, yeah, that's in, that's in. We're deporting Rica. Uh, premium beer incident is starting on Arcota. In New York, all hell is breaking loose. You've got the banana shooting people. And they came and said, look, we don't need this. We don't need this TV show, this Elliot. Yeah, Costello and Costello and uh, Nitty. That was right before Costello. Oh, and the, you know, the strange thing, to this day, Chicago um, doesn't even really want to recognize Elliot Ness because there's so, oh, the shadow of Al Capone is, is still, it remains over Chicago. All these years later, he's in every souvenir shop. Um, you know, and, and Chicago had tried to, to rid themselves of that, you know, reputation for so long that anything associated with it seems to make them uh, run the other way. Just a few years ago, we were very, very close to naming um, the ATF headquarters in Washington after Elliot Ness. And we had both Illinois senators um, had, already, had drafted a bill they were supportive of it. They had gone public on it. And a pretty much a lone Chicago alderman uh, put a stop to the whole thing because he said, uh, we shouldn't name any buildings after Elliot Ness. And there's not one marker to Elliot Ness in the city of Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. And it's all a part of the, the you know, that, that whole era still haunts the city like a ghost. Yeah, yeah. There was a Capone Museum for a while. I actually went through it. My brother got married in Chicago, and uh, I understand it closed pretty quickly, though. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the tour bus still go to his house. And the, the tour bus, the Dillinger Museum, closed here in, uh, in northwestern Indiana in Crown Point. Um, but yeah, the, the Capone per se museum closed, but yeah, the tour bus is still towards you go out apparently prairie avenue isn't close it's pretty far out there in chicago so people really yeah, I've been out to capone's house out there yeah that's what i meant he lived, on, he lived on the same street as elliot ness did but quite a quite a distance apart really? um, and what's fascinating when you go to that house just like just like elliot ness you know wanted to come home and you know live live a kind of quiet suburban family life. At the beginning, that's really what Al Capone wanted too. I mean, his, his, his actual house that he shared with his, his mother and his wife and his kids um, is a kind of modest suburban uh, two-story house. And um, I mean, it was only, you know, if you look at the way that the immigrants from, from Italy and Poland and Germany were treated at the turn of the century, they, they really, they weren't allowed to get a lot of the good jobs and so what was what was left was sort of low-level crime um, racetracks brothels gambling joints and prohibition just created this vacuum that allowed uh, people with with smarts and ambition to make a lot of money very fast and when he was working at the Hotel Lexington in the loop um, he would still go back to Prairie Avenue and have dinner um, with his, his wife and his mother yeah. uh, and his kids. Yeah. And, and that was, I, I think if you, if you could ever sort of break into the, the, the soul of Al Capone, that's what, he, that's what he wanted at the end of 
the day. And, and the rest of it, I think, just just took off just just as fast as all the fast cars that were being manufactured at the time. Yeah, because the real Al Capone was nothing like the legend. You know, somebody wrote a wonderful sentence. Pro, I'm giving you an abbreviated uh, prohibition turned us into a, a nation of lawbreakers. So, and not in some big way, but when you had a beer that was outlawed, you broke the law. And so it became, it was the start of something fashionable to, you know, have a bit of contempt for the law. Uh, one thing, uh, a priest who mentored me for a year, he said, you know, the, it's, it's in Latin, but I've forgotten how to say it. the The mighty fall hard, you know? And so you've got, as an example, two extremes. We've got John Kennedy, and no one believes that a lunatic with a rifle killed him. It can't be. He's too great. He's too awesome. He's too, it couldn't have happened. It had to have been a mighty force. And on the other end of that, we've got, Elliot Ness, a decent guy, and people have consistently buried him as a failure, as an alcoholic, and so forth. So fame dies hard, no? Mm -hmm. It's curious, the cemetery where he is, uh, his ashes were dispersed on a lake, but I do have a monument nearby, and the cemetery tells me it's one of the most popularly visited um, graves. Let me finish up, Rebecca, if you could tell us so you went, uh, how you got the ashes and, and so on? I'd tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> I am sworn to secrecy. Line. Yeah. Uh, it is, it's been published in books, but I've been sworn to secrecy and I want to keep my promise. But uh, the ashes were given to me as a result of having been on the a &E biography. Mm -hmm. One of the producers said, you know, that I took him all over town, showed where he lived, where he worked, introduced him to a few people who were still alive who knew him. And the one thing I didn't know is whatever happened to his ashes. So um, the producer called me about a year later and said, you know, it bothered him. He said, it bothers me that you don't know once something that I know. And he told me a woman's first name and her phone number and said, the rest is up to you. So I called her took me a year to win her over. And I said, you know, I would like to see that he has a very honorable ceremony. Um, I would like to conduct his funeral. And um, she did finally relent and allow me to plan it. <clears throat> and I used the FBI, the ATF, Secret Service, as all to be a part of the funeral. And it was great. International media came. We had over 2,000 people. Wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as I say, it's still the most popularly visited. And, um, and he it to, uh, buried in water, apparently, right? That was her one criteria, and I don't understand why. And and he was, said, actually, he was cremated in Buffalo, New York. I, correct. I got a hold, I'm from Buffalo, and I, I got a hold of the cremation certificate from Forest Lawn, <laughs> Forest Lawn Cemetery, where... Um, uh, Rick James, Millard Fillmore, and Shirley Chisholm are all buried. <laughs> but, um, wow. but yeah, in Buffalo is only about an hour and a half from Cowder's Park. That's right. Yeah. You, 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 there's a lake there, and you said it in 130 <laughs> odd years, no one was allowed ashes in the lake. But they, For 140 years, they had a policy no one may be buried in Wade Lake. Yeah. And yet they waived it for Elliot Ness. And Wade Lake is the lake in the cemetery, but yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was very nice. Is there very a nice. stone there today? <coughs> Excuse me. It's all right. Yes, um, it was interesting. I, I would go around and I said, <clears throat> you know, that I was going to conduct his funeral, but I didn't have any money to spend on it, but I went to... John's Carabelli Monument, and I said, I have Elliot Ness's ashes to do the funeral. We need a monument. Um, can you kind of let me know what it might run? And I thought I would get donations. This is before GoFundMe and all that. <laughs> I thought, I'll get some donations. We'll make it happen. And they just said, how big do you want it? What do you want it to look like? No charge. Everywhere I went, no charge. And it was wonderful. In fact, people sent me money, $15,000 approximately, that I didn't need for the funeral. 
So we started the Elliot Ness um, Education Fund at the Police Museum and started traveling museum in a box. Yeah. 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 There are a few of these instances throughout throughout time, uh, throughout the incarnation of these these uh, exceptional Americans. And I, I think that Ness falls into that category, and I think that, that, that people react to that as 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 your story as your story shows. I think that yeah that people want to honor that whatever whatever side of the spectrum or anything people find themselves on. There are these stellar examples that that we we respond to, and and I think that Ness is just one of those, and and the. The instance of, of trying to tear him down, or well, he died in alcohol. I don't. I don't think that, that has diminished things. I think that is just, like I said, I think it's just kind of shot in Florida. And as as you experienced when when you went to to memorialize, and people turned out, and, and people helped, and people did because he is that example. They did, and it was a respectful ceremony. And I think I would challenge anybody who tells me he was an alcoholic. I like to say, prove it. To show me how. Show me where they can't prove it, and um, you know, I don't, I think that if a person did something bad, we should own up to it and recognize it. But to demean him just because he was of a heroic stature, it also kind of bothers me that that, that hold. It, I mean, let's say somebody ran into some some troubled times, and and, and just, but but that you're going to mm -hmm. diminish them by saying, well, he was just a drunk. I mean, what we know now, I mean, that's that's really not something you should be slinging at somebody as an insult. But second off, we know he was in a lot of, the times were completely different period. I mean, you didn't oh, yeah. come home and have a gin, you came home and had a bottle. And that was just period. That was just how you relaxed at the end of the day, yeah. like, whether nested or not. So I, I don't like throwing that around as an insult. But. We right. have to close it up. Uh, but first, before we go, Christine, tell us true, true crime and justice. What, um, what is your black spot? What do you got? What is your, uh, I'm sorry. Oh. Blogspot is it? It's a page or something, right? Yeah, it's it's a website. Um, well, right now I just have my nest stories up. Next, I'm going to be working on women and organized crime. I'm going to be doing a series. I hope to get a an story out every Monday. So. Good. Yeah. There's a lot of fascinating stories about women. Yeah. 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 And the, you know, we ought to consider something about that because I've I've got like yeah. eight pages I'd like to reach out. Yeah, uh, Dorothy Drake is something you should want to consider covering. Janice, Janice Drake. Dorothy Drake? Janice Drake. Janice Drake, uh, that's horrible. Um, a lot of amazing female stories that happened there, and they weren't always the victim. They were victims most of the time. Though. Even Capone's mother was a, that's a story in itself. You know? But I want to thank you all for coming very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. We'll talk to you again soon. You'll come on. Rebecca, it's uh, great to have you. You're a lot of fun. You're welcome to college. Thank you. I look forward to building a long relationship with you, and you can come back on every Monday if you want and tell us about your story. Right. Pam, eh, no. <laughs> you can take me or leave me, right? I love you, man. <laughs> I'm going to stop right now, but if you guys want to hang around for just a, a second, we'll be fine. Thank right. you, and uh, thanks for